morning ladies and gentlemen I hope have a good time so this is the last talk for the school and we have uh, professor siraj hasan delivering the concluding talk professor siraj hasan is a scientist well known internationally for his distinguished academic and research work in astrophysics with specialization in magneto hydrodynamic processes occurring in the atmosphere of the sun Hassan completed his schooling from Mayo College Ajmer. He received his master's in physics from Delhi University in 1972 and doctorate in theoretical astrophysics from the University of Oxford UK in 1977. Thereafter he joined the faculty of the Indian Institute of uh, Astrophysics Bangalore and served as its director from 2006 to 2012. From 2012 to 2014 he was distinguished professor and then honorary professor at the institute hasan has been recipient of several international fellowships and awards such as the commonwealth alexander von humboldt and the smithsonian fellowships he was also an associate of the harvard college observatory hasan has held visiting uh, faculty positions in many premier institutions such as center of astrophysics at harvard Department of Theoretical Physics at University of Oxford, Queen Mary and Westfield College of London University, Paris Observatory and several others. His uh, he is a life member of the Clare Hall College at Cambridge and was a hamed visiting lecturer at University of Cambridge in uh, 2013. With large number of research publications to his credit, Hassan's work is widely cited and has made a significant impact in his field. He has trained and guided several graduate students for their PhD work as well as su supervised a number of postdocs. He is a principal investigator of the in Indian National Large Solar Telescope project located on Indian soil it will be one of the largest telescopes of its kind in the world. Hasan is a member of many professional bodies and societies such as Astronomical Society of India, the International Astronomical Union and the American Astronomical Society. He is currently the president of Oxford and Cambridge Society of Bangalore and was still recently the chairman of the governing council of the Vishweshwaraya Technological Museum Bangalore. He is on the board of many institutions such as Indian Institute of Advanced Studies Bangalore and the Indian Institute the Institute of Plasma Research in Gandhinagar. Professor Hasan will be delivering a talk uh, on the new insights and challenges in probing our nearest star. Uh, the sun is a cosmic powerhouse and it has uh, had a profound impact on our planet and its future it's a giant laboratory that enables us to probe and test processes in high temperature plasmas and that cannot ordinarily simulated uh, in the terrestrial environment being the nearest star it serves as a proxy for understanding condition in other stars a stormy atmosphere displays rich phenomena ranging from sunspots to powerful explosions that strongly influence the earth and the space environment The sun's activity is fundamentally due to solar magnetism and an emission changes with the sun's such cycle as well as uh, on longer time scales of centuries to millions of years. Unraveling the mysteries of these complex processes involving sophisticated mathematical modeling as well as observation continues to pose major challenges to scientists. Uh, this talk will highlight some of the major recent developments in this area including uh, helioseismology through which the solar interior can be probed the nature of magnetism and its role in modulating activity and eruptions such as flares in the sun solar atmosphere india is expected to take a major initiative uh, in the study of the of the sun through setting up the world class facility it will be one of the world's most powerful solar telescope to address a multitude of crucial well posed problems in astrophysics and critical issues in the sun's important influences on the earth space weather and understanding the release of solar energy into solar system on a gigantic scale may we have a pr huge round of applause for professor hasan and we really thank him for taking his out his time for the concluding talk professor hasan over to you okay uh <clears throat> good morning uh, friends uh, first of all uh, i want to thank uh, prana for his uh, kind introduction and also for inviting me to give this uh, valedictory talk um when he asked me to give this talk i wasn't uh, quite sure at what level i should uh, pitch this talk whether this is for 
It's not exactly the kind of talk one is giving, say, to members of the Rotary Club. On the other hand, it's not the kind of talk one is giving at a specialist conference. So it has to be somewhere in the middle. So he told me most of the students have already a, a, a reasonable background in astronomy, and so that made that increased my comfort level considerably. So, so having once I knew that, I, I didn't feel the need to apologize for using various technical terms. But if at any stage uh, I use terminology which seems unfamiliar, uh, please do at that point ask me that, look, we don't understand what that is. Um, so anyway, let me just begin with this short video. It's an alien landscape where magnetic tornadoes twist upward tens of thousands of miles. Mysterious dark spots large enough to engulf the Earth ebb and flow. And violent eruptions shoot tons of charged particles into space at speeds of over two million miles per hour. This is not some strange world on the other side of the galaxy. Uh, and the last term is, this is in fact our sun. So, um, and that's going to be the topic of my, of my lecture this morning. Um, so ever since the dawn of civilization, man has wondered um, about the sun, you know, about uh, the nature of the sun. And the uh, sun has, over the years, The sun has, over the years, uh, been used for uh, measuring time, for monitoring agricultural activities, uh, for also used for religious, uh, religious purposes. So it's kind of uh, had a multitude of roles. Uh, so this has been going on for a long time. Now, in, if you take various civilizations, the sun has, uh, has had a deep significance. So let's take, for example, uh, the Indian civilization, uh, where it comes, the Rig Veda says that all that exists was born from Surya, the god of gods. And uh, here is a, here is a painting. Uh, I think it's the 19th, 19th century of Surya on his chariot. Uh, many of you, uh, it's, it's too loud. Okay. Many of you uh, might have seen the Sun Temple um, in uh, Konarak, in Urissa. And um, if you look carefully, uh, you will find that uh, this is basically the sun symbolizes it's a chariot uh, driven by, and you see the, the ornament, the wheels, which has, uh, you see these two, 12 wheels. Uh, so the sun has uh, a significance in many civilizations. I'm not going to go into all of them, and that itself could be the topic of a separate lecture, but I'm just going to give a couple more examples, uh, illustrative examples. Uh, in ancient Egypt, the, the sun god is called Ra, and the body, of the, the, the body of Ra is supposed to be the disk of the sun. And uh, here is a picture where you actually see the sun as a combination of Ra and the falcon god, so it's what they call Re Horacti. Uh, many of you uh, would have uh, been to, uh, to Delhi and seen the Jantar Vantar. I hope uh, most of you have, have seen that. Uh, Jantar Vantar was one of five observatories which was made by Jai Singh in 1725. Uh, this one in uh, Delhi and the one in Jaipur, which I happened to see last year, are both in very good condition. They were used for, they were basically, they were not, they were not although the telescope had been invented, it somehow or the other had not made its way uh, to India. Uh, so these were basically used, they used these stones as visual markers to study the sun, the moon, the planets. So it was, a, it was actually an observatory and the records that uh, are available based on these measurements, actually provide very valuable information. 
So let's now, let's now just start off by giving you some more examples of the kind of phenomena that take place on the sun. Now this, this movie is actually a compilation of uh, different images taken over a period of five years by an American satellite called the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So these are uh, some of the spectacular images which you can see here. I'll tell you a little bit about each of these uh, phenomena separately when I come to them. But I just want you to get a feel for how well we can actually form satellites, we can actually uh, look at the sun and see in detail the phenomena that are taking place. This was, would not have been possible, for example, when I was uh, your age uh, studying uh, physics and astronomy. So, you see, you see, so these are the different, uh, different uh, processes that are taking place on the sun. Now this is a, another composite image taken in the extreme ultraviolet uh, wavelengths uh, by the Solar Dynamics Observatory again. Um, and here you see that the green actually, uh, the red denotes the comparatively cooler regions, about uh, 60,000, and cool is a relative term, but on the sun, 60,000 is cool in the outer atmosphere. And uh, the green and blue denotes temperatures of about a million degrees. And on the left corner, you will actually see a, a filament erupting. You see, this has been captured in very nice detail by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is a, a picture of a gigantic object which is called a solar prominence. It was taken by, a, it was taken by SOHO, and that's another American satellite. And it was taken around 1999. Uh, and you see this uh, gigantic structure, loop-like structure. It goes out to almost like 35 solar radii. It's, it's, it's enormous. Sorry, 35 Earth uh, radii. It's, it's, it's enormous. For comparison, just to get the scale of that, you actually see the Earth. It's just been put there. It's, it's, uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of this, uh, of this uh, uh, structure. Now, in 1946, a very spectacular explosion took place. Uh, and it's so, even now it's remembered, and it's called the, the Grandpapa, Granddaddy Prominence. The Granddaddy Prominence is a, is a huge prominence, which is again a kind of a loop like structure, which was stable for a long time, and then suddenly it erupted. And it was photographed in the wavelength of H alpha, which is 65, 63 angstroms, for those who would like to know about these things. And uh, it captures temperatures of the order of about 20,000 degrees. And the size of the prominence that is from the surface right up to the arc, where the lower arc, is about uh, 200,000 kilometers. So we are really talking of, of distances. I mean, the size of the sun is, the radius of the sun is about 700,000 kilometers. So we're talking of something like a third of the radius of the sun. So it's a huge structure. Now this is, again, another eruption, again, of what they call an erupting prominence. Uh, and this is something like a, a third of the solar radius. So it's, uh, you can see in the incredible detail that has been captured, about, uh, which shows you the, the morphology of these objects. The next process that, uh, and you saw all this in the compilation which I showed you earlier, but I'm taking now so the separate individual processes. This is called a solar flare. A solar flare is a, a sudden explosion on the sun. Uh, it takes place on a time scale. It starts off, it has a very rapid phase, and then it has a comparatively gradual phase. The whole process lasts of the order of 30 minutes to an hour, in which a large amount of energy is, is released over all wavelengths, from visible, radio, uh, extreme, ultraviolet, ultraviolet, uh, and so on, gamma rays, x-rays, and so on. So the solar flares are, are comparatively uh, energetic phenomena which take place 
on a comparatively short time scale, as I said, of minutes to an hour. This shows you again this animation. It's not an animation, actually, this video shows you a, a solar flare eruption taking place on the sun. This is again taken in uh, extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, and the final process that I would like to show you uh, is called a coronal mass ejection. Uh, some of these processes are actually, they happen together, sometimes they happen individually. Coronal mass ejections are, is a process in which large amounts of matter from the solar corona is ejected, hurled out into space at speeds of thousands of kilometers per second. And uh, these, uh, this can have uh, also devastating consequences, which I'll talk about a little later on. But uh, uh, these processes sometimes are related. Sometimes you have a, a solar flare which takes place, and then suddenly you have this eruption or coronal mass ejection in which large material is. Sometimes it happens even along with prominences. So, I mean, it's. Uh, uh, they are basically, if you look at the underlying physics of the whole process, it's all, as I will sh talk about later, it's all related to the magnetic field. And there are different types of uh, processes, uh, but these involve instabilities in the magnetic fields. Uh, it's still a topic of uh, considerable research. I don't think the final word has been said as to what is the definitive cause, but we are getting closer and closer to, the, um, to getting uh, a better idea of how the, uh, how the solar magnetism influences the activity on the sun. So let me just uh, give you some basic information, just to kind of set the scene. Uh, the sun is eight light minutes, 150 million kilometers from the Earth. It consists mainly of hydrogen uh, with some helium, and then it has 1% uh, of other material. It's uh, very massive. Uh, it's uh, about 110 times the size of the Earth. It has a surface temperature. The word surface has to be used. Uh, it, it's not a solid surface. It's the surface of where the light comes from, as many of you would know. Uh, and that temperature is close to about 6,000. But the core temperature, and I'll mention, tell you what, what I mean by core, is much higher. It's about 15 million. And that is where the nuclear reactions take place uh, from which the energy of the sun is generated. Uh, it has an interesting way it rotates rather slowly, not like the Earth, once in 24 hours. It rotates rather slowly. It takes 26 days, but it rotates in an interesting way. It rotates faster at the equator and slower at the poles. So it takes about 26 days to go around at the equator, but it takes more than 30 days to go around at the poles. Uh, and it is believed to be uh, through different... Uh, uh, methods, we have now been able to find that the age of the sun is about 4.6 billion years. Uh, it's uh, in one of the spiral arms of our Milky Way at a distance of about 30,000 light years. Um, and uh, it is one of billions of stars, and the stars are amongst billions of galaxies. So you have uh, uh, actually, uh, it's if you look at the context of the of the cosmos, you really have billions of stars uh, in us in our Milky Way. You have billions of sun-like stars, and then you have billions of galaxies. So, uh, why do we study the sun? Some of those questions were already uh, mentioned by Pranav, so I'm not going to go into the detail which I had sent in my abstract. Why we study the sun? But uh, uh, um, I mean, it, to put it sort of briefly, it's uh, it's a place where it gives you an a, a enormous laboratory for studying processes which you just cannot simulate on the Earth. Uh, so in a sense, the, scale, the scales are such that they cannot be replicated on the Earth. And so you are looking at, at, uh, at plasmas with different, uh, with different properties. It has also um, led to tests of uh, verification of the general theory of relativity. It has had some interesting, very profound consequences for the neutrino physics. I'm not going to go into all those things because you know that would take take me off in a different direction altogether. Uh, it also has a lot of relevance. Uh, this is very topical to climate research as to 
how does the sun influence the Earth's climate? And also, how does the uh, sun influence the space environment? The space environment is the environment around the Earth. And how is that influenced by the sun? Um, but I think for people like me, it's just very interesting from a physics point of view, it's a very interesting body to study. Uh, and there's still many areas of the sun which are uh, ch posing challenges to understanding. And so I, I feel that this, uh, this is a subject which is from, a, from a, just the point of view of curiosity and to learn more uh, offers you a lot of uh, interesting possibilities. So, I'm going to uh, structure my talk in, in the, first I'll talk about what makes the sun shine, and this has of course consequences of how old the sun is, uh, where the energy of the sun comes from. Then we'll talk about what is the internal structure of the sun, very briefly. Uh, uh, then w I'll discuss some of the underlying causes of the solar phenomena, like what I showed you. I showed you some very uh, dramatic uh, videos earlier on, uh, but we need to know what is it that causes these things to happen. Um, and then uh, what is the influence of the sun on, on Earth? And uh, I'll say a few words about uh, some recent space missions to the sun. And finally, uh, I'll close by uh, mentioning some new initiatives taken by India towards studying the sun. So that's the outline of my talk. So how does the, the sun shine? Um, as many of you who already have an astrophysics background would know that the sun starts off life as a gigantic cloud of gas which uh, collapses under gravity. As it collapses, this is the process uh, of the protostar, it collapses under its gravity. The central regions start heating up the temperature, when the temperature of the central region reaches million degrees, nuclear reactions start kicking in. And at that point, this whole process takes typically a few million years. So it's a comparatively quick process from the cloud formation to the arrival of the sun on what is called the main sequence. So what I've plotted here, this graph that you see, is actually uh, what is called a main sequence. It plots the, on the x-axis the surface temperature against the luminosity of the sun. So this is typically the path which uh, most stars follow when they s start their life as, as clouds of gas and then eventually land up on the main sequence and that's where they stay. So sun is right now like a man in middle age, will stay there for quite some time and then eventually burn out of fuel and that can, and depending on the mass, it will end up in different ways. So, if you were to, this, is, this cartoon basically shows you, if you were to look at a cutout of the sun from inside, uh, this is what you might expect. Uh, there's a central region which is about 25% of the radius of the sun, which is called the core, where the energy of the sun is uh, generated, and the generation takes place through the, uh, through the conversion of hydrogen into helium. Of course, there are some other side processes, but I'm not going to go into, the, into, into, that, into those details. But that's basically the idea, is the energy is generated through nuclear reactions. This energy then travels from about 25% of the radius of the sun to about 70% through radiation. It's still very opaque. I mean, it takes a long time for a photon from the, from the middle to actually reach the 70%, uh, but when it reaches about the 70%, uh, its radiative transfer or transport of energy becomes totally inefficient, and the more efficient energy, efficient form of transport is through convection. Convection, as you know, is very much like what happens when you put water to boil on a kettle. The heat gets it's heated. The, basically, the material rises. That's how the heat it goes to the top. It cools and comes down and forms a convective current. And so this region from 70% uh, solar radius to what we call the sun, the, ra the surface, which is where most of the light comes, uh, is about 30%. So that's called the convection zone. So that's where, uh, that's how the energy, and then finally, convection again loses its, 
its efficiency when it reaches what I call the solar surface, and from there again, it is just transported out through radiation. Now, how do we uh, know about the conditions within the solar surface? As I said, it's, they're not accessible to us through visible wavelengths. The only, the only type of uh, way we can, can know about the interior is through neutrinos, but then neutrinos are very difficult to uh, the neutrinos are, are, are actually uh, very difficult to actually use neutrinos for studying because the point is that they are they just they just pass through everything. So that's a it's a, it was a very difficult problem itself to be able to to uh, determine the the neutrino flux. But I'm not going to go into that. So the way uh, uh, we the the way that is normally done is that the sun the sun actually in the convection zone. Uh, a large amount of uh, acoustic or sound type of waves are created. It's basically hydrogen, highly convecting, and this convection generates uh, sound waves. These sound waves are generated close to the surface, and depending on their wavelength, the shorter wavelengths actually, because the phase speed actually increases very rapidly, they start, they actually bend. So the shorter the wavelength, the sh less is the shallow is the region in which they stay. The, the long wavelengths actually penetrate to the interior, to the deeper regions. And by actually studying different, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but basically different wavelengths allow you to sample the physical conditions in different regions of the sun. So this subject is called helioseismology and has provided a rich amount of information about the conditions in the interior of the sun. And if you were to speed up these waves, you, actually the, the period of these waves is it's, it's 3.3 millihertz, which is not at all visible. But if you were to speed it up by about 40,000 times, this is what it would sound like. I mean, it's, just, it's no language, but just, just a lot of, lot of noise. So that's what, that's, these are the kind of waves which have been observed now for almost 30 years. And uh, by very careful, you can actually decompose them into their several ha different ha wavelengths. And, uh, and then, you can, uh, and then you, know, you can do these little tricks and uh, get an idea of uh, what they would sound like. OK, so now comes the question, uh, what actually drives solar activity? I mean, I, as I mentioned, that there are many uh, uh, processes that take place, explosive processes that take place, some not so explosive. Uh, but the question is that uh, they definitely, you definitely see a range of phenomena taking place on the sun, and what is the underlying physics behind all this. Now, be before going into uh, any specific, in fact, I will not be going into specific details because this is an overview. but. One thing is generally accepted by everybody, and that is that it is the magnetic field of the sun, the sun's magnetism, which basically influences the different types of processes that you have. So this uh, picture actually shows you uh, three types of fields. Uh, you see the red arrows close to the poles, which, are, which show open field lines. And then you have these gray arrows, which are more or less like radial. Um, and these are the this is the field which actually carries the particles from the sun, which is called the solar wind. And this is the solar wind, which, which is actually emitted in all directions. And it, uh, in fact, it, this is something which comes and impinges on the Earth's atmosphere as well. So that's the solar wind. Uh, and then you have these uh, closed lines in orange. And these are, these are what, you, what produces uh, the, the kind of closed structures like loops that I showed you earlier on. Now, one of the most uh, well-known examples of the magnetic field of the sun is our sunspots. Now, sunspots have, uh, have been observed, of course, for a very long time. I think the Chinese observed them uh, way back in 28 BC. But uh, it was Galileo who used the newly invented telescope in 1609 to actually start studying uh, sunspots in a somewhat systematic manner. And in those days, as was the, the, 
the way you did research was you saw something and then you drew it. And if you could draw, draw well, you would be able to depict that phenomena very reasonably accurately. So he made all these, he made charts and charts uh, like this, showing you the positions of sunspots. Now, if you were to look today at the sun with a, with a telescope, a low resolution, so look at the picture on the top, that shows you a low resolution picture of the sun, but you see those dark areas, which are sunspots. Now, if you take a close up, for example, of the one region on the right side, you would see the, you would see these sunspots, you see a sunspot group. And again, I've uh, placed the Earth just to, for you to get an idea. So you can see the size of a sunspot is comparable to the size of the Earth. So it's quite, uh, it's, they're, they're, they're about you know, several thousand kilometers in, uh, in diameter. Uh, and if you were to take a, observe a, te a sunspot with a telescope from the, from the ground, from the Earth, uh, you would be able to, if you had very good observing conditions, you would be able to see an image like this. This, uh, what you see, this gentle kind of change in the intensity is due to the Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere basically produces this type of scintillation. Uh, if you were to look at it from space, you would not see this at all. You would just see one image frozen. But it's the Earth's atmosphere. But we have ways of, uh, of trying to overcome what is called the effects of the Earth's seeing uh, through different methods called adaptive optics. Um, but anyway, now what, what, what I want to tell you is that the sunspot shows you a central region which is very dark, and the temperature in the central region is about typically 2,000 degrees less. So I, I told you earlier that this temperature in the photosphere, the surface of the sun, is about 6,000. This is about 2,000. Uh, degrees less. And so the question one can very legitimately ask is why are sunspots dark? This question has been asked for a very long time and you would be surprised to know that we still don't have a, a proper answer to this question. We do have we do have some theories but I don't think we have uh, any definitive theory which says why it's dark. The general th belief is that the sunspots are dark because of the fact that the strong magnetic field inhibits or reduces the efficiency of convective transport because the convection depends basically on being able to convert, uh, complete a full circuit for the eddies or for these elements which are going up and down. And the magnetic field doesn't allow you to move material across the magnetic field, so the transport of energy which is coming from below gets reduced, and so this reduced energy transport ends up in a lower temperature and giving you the appearance of a, of a dark sunspot. But that is a little bit superficial, I would say. Not, it's not the full story, because this, if you have that, then people say that you, there should be a, a bright ring around the sunspot, because this heat which is blocked off here should actually appear. And people have tried to look for those uh, signatures. And so anyway, the question really is still very much a topic of research, I should say. This is a sort of a, an, this is an animation actually, uh, based on a computer model of showing you how sunspots are actually formed. They are generate, these are fields which coming from the interior, they come up, they pierce through the surface, and some, you know, get elongated and stretch out, erupt, some stay there for long periods are comparatively stable. So this is a, a sort of a, an anime, this is a computer simulation, I should say. Now, sunspots have been, have been known for a long time, as I mentioned, but they've been systematically studied for, I would say, starting from about 1844, when uh, this gentleman called Heinrich Schwaber, who was an amateur astronomer in Germany, he noticed that the number of sunspots, and what he plots here is the number of sunspots as a function of time. It's a fairly straightforward thing to do if you have the data. And he found that the number of sunspots increases and decreases in a regular way. And if you look at this, you will find that the 
it's actually going up and down with an 11-year cycle. Close, but it's not exactly 11 years. Sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 14, but it's close to 11 years. And uh, this has been verified. I mean, this now you've the systematic studies of sunspots every day from 1849. Sunspots were observed, have been noted, and so you have uh, you actually have a com continuous uh, you have a continuous coverage of. Uh, the, of data of, of sunspots from 1849. Every day they've been observed. And uh, the way sunspots, if you look at how these sunspots, if you look at the location of these sunspots, you find that sunspots typically appear in two bands on either side of the equator. And then these bands then drift, so the number of sunspots increases, they drift, they go towards the equator, and then eventually they disperse. There are no sunspots, or very few. And then again, it increases and it goes down. And this is what is called a butterfly diagram. It's, a, it's a just a depiction of, uh, of how sunspots, uh, how the number of sunspots increases and decreases over a period of time. Uh, this shows you, this is an image in the extreme ultraviolet, uh, showing you a picture of the sun at a time of very low activity, that is when very low sunspots uh, which is 1996, and then a period uh, in 1999 when the sunspot activities had increased. So sunspots, when you have very few sunspots, this is well known, when you have very few sunspots, there's very little activity. The sunspots are what produces the magnetism of the sun. When there are fewer sunspots, the, sun, the sun's magnetic field is comparatively weak. We are currently at a time what is called a solar minimum. There is very little sunspots around. So hardly anything interest of any interest happening on the sun presently. So this is so this is the this is what it would have been like. This is what it was like in 1996, and the right picture shows you what it was like three years later. And so this shows you these are just showing you how the sun looks over time, over different years. So 2001, for example, was a period of uh, a maximum where there was a lot of activity. 2006 was a time when there was very little activity, so the sun becomes very dark. You don't really see. This is taken, in, in again, in extreme ultraviolet. But uh, OK, now the last solar cycle, so which is, I mean, solar cycles from 1844 were numbered one and so on. So. Uh, the last, we are really at the end of us, what is called of cycle 24. Uh, and this picture shows you, uh, in the jagged lines, actually shows you the actual data. So it shows you the number of sunspots on the y-axis as a function of time. Uh, there has also been a lot of effort going on to be able to predict solar activity. So people have tried to build computer models and using previous data, trying to reproduce the data based on computer models so that they can then make predictions of what will happen in the future. So there's a lot of interest, apart from, from just wanting to know what's happening on the sun, but there's a lot of interest uh, related to space weather because when you have uh, strong cycles, you will have more activity, you will have more flares, and then people need to worry about that how it would affect the Earth and so on. So there is a, a lot of interest amongst many communities as to being able to predict uh, whether a cycle is going to be a strong one or a weak one. So the dotted lines actually show you the predictions. So there were many models, and this, this is a model which happened to give the best, best fit to the data. This is the present cycle. So we are just at the beginning of uh, the red is the beginning of solar cycle 25. We are just starting. So this is a period of time of minimum. The solar cycle will peak around 2024 or so. Now, if you actually look at a record of, uh, of uh, solar activity over several centuries, uh, you would notice that there is a period from 1645 to 1715 when there are actually no sunspots at all. I mean, apart from this period where you see this, this Well, you see this part showing absolutely a absolutely flat curve, which means there's hardly any solar activity at all. But then after that, 
it's picked up and it's, it's a regular, you have the regular cycle that I talked to you about. Uh, this period is, uh, is now well documented. It's called the Maunder Minimum. And uh, it's, uh, it's again a topic of much research to try to understand what is it in the sun's uh, uh, generation mechanism that suddenly switched off for 75 years uh, and then came back again. And people believe that it is something to do with chaos. So it's some sort of uh, consequence of nonlinear, of, 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 of a nonlinear system which can go through episodes like this. But it's still, it's not conclusively known, but it's, there's a, that's a sort of a clue that people have, that this might be the Maunder minimum, this period of switch off of solar activity could be due to uh, the nature of a, a nonlinear system. Now, how are solar magnetic fields created? We've, we've already mentioned that you have sunspots, you have large different types of processes taking place on the sun. And then the question, and we said that's due to magnetism, but how is this magnetic field created? It is now generally believed that the magnetic field is created through a, a, a dynamo process, pretty much like what you have. And, well, I don't know, I mean, you may, be, you may be not familiar, but when I was young, we used to ride cycles with dynamos, you know, and the dynamos used to charge the lights. It's the idea is a similar thing. Uh, the way it works is that if you have a magnetic field, sit principally in the north-south direction, what we call a poloidal field, uh, because of the sun's differential rotation, as I mentioned, it, it, it rotates faster at the equator. Than, so the field at the center will start getting twisted up. And these twists will also interact with the motions, the eddies that you, I mentioned, that you have a convection zone where you have gases which are moving. And that will create a, a contortions in the field lines. And these field lines will, it is believed, will then lead to the formation of structures resembling sunspots. So this is, again, uh, uh, many uh, theoretical calculations have taken place to try to reproduce how this dynamo works. And this is, a, this is again, a computer simulation uh, where you sh which shows you in, like, copper wires uh, structure. These are the magnetic field lines. On the right, you see how the how the field lines, and you see the association with sunspots. So when the sunspots is very, very few sunspots, the field structure is comparatively simple. But once, when the sunspots are large, the field gets much more complicated. Uh, so this, this is just a simulation based on these ideas of the dynamo and how the dynamo would uh, result in a change in the sunspots. Uh, I'm not going to say this. I've already mentioned earlier what I mean by space weather. Space weather, as I said, is uh, how the phenomena on the sun influences the environment around the Earth. Uh, I just, in, in passing, I should mention that uh, uh, there have uh, been two, uh, two episodes. One was in 1859 uh, when an enormous uh, uh, explosion, solar flare, which is really of... Uh, of, of an intensity which has not since been observed. And uh, it, uh, it's been documented. Now, this, if that flare had taken place today, it could have had devastating consequences. All your GPS, all of your cell phones wouldn't have worked. I mean, it would, have, it would have had a global impact, which could have been devastating. In 1989, there was uh, another episode, not as uh, intense as the one in 1859. Uh, and in that, uh, Northern, you see, most of the, what happens is that when these particles come, they get trapped by the field, and then they create intense currents which go uh, towards the poles. And so, uh, the, so the areas which are close to the poles are affected much more. So Quebec uh, in Canada, the entire grid of Quebec was, uh, was knocked out for some time. So these are some of the consequences uh, for the Earth, you know. So that's... To this, this whole field is called space weather. Uh, this animation shows you uh, what uh, shows you the ejection of a coronal mass ejection, a CME, 
as moves and then coming and hitting the Earth's surface. Actually, it's hitting, it's interacting with the magnetic field around the Earth, and then it gets into the into the, the field lines, and then these field lines create charged particles, which then funnel towards the poles. Uh, so now uh, let's let's talk about uh, something else. As uh, does the sun uh, influence climate? Uh, now it depends very much on the time scale that we are talking about. On a time scale of billions of years, definitely, because that's the time scale on which the sun's evolution takes place. Um, it is now generally believed that the early sun, that is several billion years ago, was, uh, was only about 70% of its present brightness. And uh, it's slowly its uh, luminosity has been increasing. And in about uh, three billion years from now, the sun will start moving towards what's called a red giant. Its uh, luminosity will, it will start expanding, and most likely it will reach, it will engulf the Earth as well. So certainly the temperatures around in the, in, in, uh, in the terrestrial environment will become very, very high. Uh, so certainly it's going to affect, it's quite obvious that it will have an effect on the Earth's climate. Now, if we turn to, on a shorter time scale of millions of years, uh, now, on these time scales, you have ice ages. They've been, it is generally believed that there have been five uh, major ice ages. The first ice age started about two billion years ago, and the most recent one started about three million years ago. Now, we are in this phase, or this ice age, but in the ice age, the, there are shorter periods uh, where you have uh, comparative, uh, you have durations where you have warmer climate and you have shorter, uh, and, and we have colder climate. So we are in a, in a warm interglacial period. Uh, and these ice ages, it is believed, are affected by the Earth's orbital parameters. For example, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the so eccentricity depends also on the precession of, the, of its tilt and the angle of the tilt. So these, these are the orbital parameters, and it is now believed that uh, the explanation of the ice ages is due to these parameters, what is called the Milankovitch cycle. That's been reasonably well explained by, by the Milankovitch cycle. That's not, an, that's not an area I work on, but that is, that is what uh, uh, is generally believed. Now, when it comes to time scales of centuries to thousands of years, um, there are increasing indications that the, the sun's uh, activity has a correlation with what is going on on Earth. And I'll show you uh, a, a graph showing that. On shorter time scales of tens of, to decades to maybe 100 years, uh, this, is, there is, this is a somewhat murky subject. And uh, there's also a lot of political sentiment. For example, Trump does not believe that there's global warming at all. I mean, I mean there's a whole school of thought. Clump is only one of those persons. There's a whole school of thought which believes, and I think there are some vested interests in that. They, they, they don't believe in global warming. They don't believe in that what man is doing today is actually having any effect on the climate. They say these climate things happen on long time scales. You, this small thing is not going to make much difference to it. Very dangerous way of thinking, I think. But let, let me just come back to what I mentioned earlier. The time scale on, uh, on the correlation on time scales of say hundreds of years to a thousand of years. And this is, uh, I don't expect you to go into the details of this, but it shows you a correlation on the left side is the sunspot number. The x-axis shows you time. The right side shows you the changes in temperature. And again, what it shows you is that there is a correlation between the solar activity and temperature change. Now this is where, this is what I was talking about earlier. The blue curve shows you the solar irradiance. Irradiance is the total amount of energy that we receive on the Earth's surface uh, as a function of time. And as you can see, that up to about, you know, 100 years ago, there's a, there's a very good correlation. You can see that, and the red actually shows you the temperature change. But then the temperature change starts going up. What this is called the hockey stick diagram. The temperature starts going up, whereas the solar activity, as it was before, keeps on going up and down. So had there been, 
had the temperature on the Earth been influenced only by solar activity, it is very difficult to understand why there is this increase in temperature. And so this is really what has caused a lot of concern that even though solar activity has an uh, impact on temperature on the Earth, there must be some other factors which are also contributing to global warming. Okay, so now in the last part of my talk, let me just talk about uh, some of the space missions. I already showed you some spectacular observations taken by spacecraft. Uh, now, space missions, the really serious space missions to study the sun started around about uh, you know, 1996 or so, around that time. Uh, uh, so this, for example, shows you the more recent ones. This is the left panel uh, is, a Japanese, uh, uh, is a Japanese mission, which started in uh, 2006. On the right panel on the top is a mission which consists basically of two spacecraft, one ahead of the Earth, one behind the Earth. Uh, there are two identical orbit, uh, observatories, and the idea is that they give you a, a sort of a stereoscopic uh, way to observe the sun. And uh, the bottom right is the Solar Dynamics Observatory, in which, which I showed you a compilation of data in, right in the beginning of my talk. Uh, and this has actually provided excellent uh, observations, very clear observations of phenomena taking place on the solar atmosphere. I won't talk about the instruments. Those are just details. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you are aware, but in 2018, a mission was launched it is named after a very famous astrophysicist called Eugene Parker. And this purpose of this mission is to get to within almost nine solar radii. So that's a very, very close distance to the sun. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, mission technologically because the temperatures are extremely high. So how do you build a spacecraft uh, which is able to survive this very high temperature environment, and in addition to surviving, to be able to transmit data uh, which we can actually use and which gives us more information about what's going on on the sun. So this is, uh, so it was launched on the 12th of August uh, of 2018. Uh, it will come, as I said, it will be able to, it's, it's going to go through different maneuvers. It's not going to reach there right away. It's going to go through different, as you can see, in the top left uh, image, shows you that it has, uh, it actually goes through several orbits before it uh, reaches its final perihelion, which is, uh, as I said, that's going to be in 2024. So another four years, or well, four, almost five years from now. It's already had, uh, you know, it's had three uh, perihelia, which were completed. The last one was completed in September. I, I can't see very well from here. September one, and uh, they were the the perihelion distance was about uh, 35.7 solar radii, and on the 26th of December, the spacecraft flew by Venus for the second time, and this maneuver has brought the perihelion. The, that is, the perihelion means the closest distance to the sun. It has brought it down to 27.8 solar radii. Um, it's got a multitude of of objectives. Already, if you go, if you look on the internet, you will find uh, several um, observations have already started coming in from the Parker mission. Uh, the main idea is that the main idea is to actually do in situ. That is actually observe many of these things. What we do so far, we have our spacecraft, which which are basically orbiting close to the Earth, either the Earth or close to the Earth, and observing what is happening. The idea of the Parker probe mission is to actually go there and see what is happening in that environment. So it's going to be able to look at the flow of energy. It's going to look at the structure of the wind, the plasma, the magnetic field, and also the transport of energetic particles, you know, the particles, uh, the charged particles which are carried out by the solar wind. So it's got, a, it's got many uh, interesting science objectives. 
and uh, s s observations have already started coming in from Parker. It's, it's very much it's functioning very well and giving a lot of good data. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware that a few days ago, actually on the 9th of February, a European Space Agency mission called Solar Orbiter was launched. It was launched on the 9th of February. Uh, and the uh, idea of all these missions is fairly similar, to be able to study in more detail, more accurately, the processes that are taking place on the sun. It will also get close, not as close as the Parker probe, but it will get closer than Mercury. So it will get to less than 0.3 uh, astronomical units. Um, and it will, have, uh, it will have more instruments than the Parker probe, which will be looking at different wavelength regions. So it's going to have a whole suite of instruments uh, which will be studying the sun in a variety of, of wavelengths. Now, uh, India uh, has uh, also a mission to the sun. It's called Aditya, after Aditya is the sun god. Uh, and uh, it's being built by ISRO. Uh, my institute, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, is building a major payload. One of, it's actually a coronagraph, uh, visible light. In visible light is called the VELC instrument. Um, it's going to be launched, hopefully, before the end of 2020. Uh, and the interesting point about this is, of course, the objectives are very similar. I, I'm not going to go into the details, but the they're, they're mentioned, they're listed out here. Uh, it's going to study the sun, not in an orbit around the Earth, but it's going to what's called the L1 point, the L1 Lagrangian point. The L1 point is the region where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun actually cancel out each other. Uh, because the Sun is much more massive, that distance is very close to the Earth. It's about uh, one and a half million kilometers from the Earth. So that, there, there are basically all these different uh, Lagrangian points. There's L1, there's on the other side you have L2. So if you're not looking at the Sun, you want to look at the stars. There's also a mission, ISRO's planning, uh, 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 not for studying the Sun, but studying stars which will go to L2, and then there are, of course, L4, L5. So there are different reasons for choosing, and I won't go into that. There are technological reasons, cost reasons. And, but the idea of, of sending a spacecraft to L1 is that you will be always seeing the sun. You won't have, if you, if you orbit around the Earth, you always have eclipses. Every time the, 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 the satellite goes behind the Earth, you, block, you don't see it. Of course, you can do it in a sun-synchronous orbit, but uh, there are some problems with that also. Whereas if you go to uh, the Lagrangian, L1 Lagrangian point, which is one and a half million kilometers from the Earth, you actually uh, can observe the sun continuously. The, the, one of the problems when you have a spacecraft which is so far away is getting the data. It takes time. You can't transmit data uh, the way we we get data on our, on our cell phones. It takes a while for that. The data transfer rates are quite small when you transfer them from space. So it takes some time to get the data. But eventually, it will come, and we should be able to get some very good observations of the sun. So finally, let me talk about my pet project. It's a project which I proposed in uh, 2007. Uh, and this was to build a a large solar telescope on Indian soil. At that time, the largest telescopes in the world were 1.6 meters. So when we proposed this telescope, it would have been the, at that time it was the, well, it was one of the largest. There was also another telescope, which I'll talk about later, a four meter telescope. Uh, that was, and this, these were the only two major telescopes at that time which had been proposed. Um, so this proposal, has gone through a lot of reviews. It has taken a long time. Uh, and finally, uh, okay, uh, the science objectives are fairly similar. It's going to be looking. Uh, the, one of the reasons of having a, a large aperture is basically it gives you a better resolution. So you can look at very small structures on the sun. You need more light. A telescope, the idea of a telescope is to gather more light. And if you have more light, you should be able to resolve the smallest structures on the sun. Uh, so this, this will, it, this is going to be in Ladakh on the Pangong Lake. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the film called The Three Idiots. Uh, it was, there's a scene there 
uh, on the Pangong Lake. But that part, that is actually uh, just at the, I think at the southern tip of the lake. We are actually further up. We are about um, 20 kilometers from the Chinese border. Uh, and it took a long time before the Ministry of Defense cleared this project because they were a bit concerned about its proximity to China. But eventually they cleared it. Uh, and this is a superb site. Uh, actually, I gave a talk last week uh, about uh, this project and about uh, uh, how it compares to the best sites in the world. Uh, we did, on, we are still observing the conditions, what I call the, we're monitoring the, the site continuously for, for, for the last 12 years. And it gives you an opportunity to see the sun with great clarity. The, the obscure, you know, the, the scintillations or the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere is much less because of the height. I mean, you go, the higher you go, you have less atmosphere. So you can see uh, you're actually go, you're going to have less turbulence. And then you can overcome that turbulence through artificial methods, such as adaptive optics. So anyway, this is going to be at an altitude of 4,500 meters on the, at a place called Merak on the Pangong Lake in Ladakh. And the final clearance of this uh, project is expected soon. We have gone through a lot of reviews, and I think we have now, I, I think we have reached the, the final stage. And I hope that, that this project will be cleared within a, very soon. Uh, uh, just before I, let me mention, and I said that there, were, there was another project which was also at that time in project stage, which was uh, a four meter telescope. This project, this telescope has now come online. It's called the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, or DKIST for short. It's located in Hawaii. Uh, and this shows you with immense clarity. I, this, these pictures came out, actually made it to the front page of New York Times. I don't know if you know that. But this is a typical, this, this is a video showing you observation over a period of time. And you can see the the structure on the solar surface with, with great clarity. So uh, some of the things, uh, again, which were mentioned in my abstract, uh, which have already been mentioned, so I'm not going to go about it. Uh, and so I've, it's, uh, the sun is, is really, in that sense, uh, a very interesting object. It's so much happening there. The diversity of phenomena that take place on the sun is so large. Uh, Yet, uh, even though we have studied the sun very well uh, for such a long time, many of these phenomena are still not completely understood. And these, continue, and these are topics of current investigation, research investigation. And uh, that is why I feel that, uh, that uh, this is a field which is just full of potential. And these new missions, like the space missions, like the ground, the telescopes that I talked to you about are going to give us um, clues, vital clues, which will allow us to study, allow us to understand what's happening on the sun much better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions. So uh, you said about the observations, observing the solar surface and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Are there any observation uh, tools to scope into the uh, uh, sun or the dynamics which is happening inside the surface? Any uh, way to observe those also directly? No, you, uh, the, only, the only way, the only uh, radiation, or not radiation, but particles that come out from interior are the neutrinos. All the, otherwise, it is totally opaque. So there is no, no radiation that comes out of the sun from the interior. So we need indirect methods. Uh, and that's why I mentioned the, that helioseismology is uh, providing. And you, even though you might think it's indirect and may not be giving you uh, trustworthy information, actually, uh, helioseismology, there have been independent checks uh, based on models of stellar evolution, 
based on the neutrino physics as to how neutrinos. And if you were to put all this together, you have independent checks and balances. Like, for example, what is the temperature in the sun? How does the rotation of the sun vary with the depth? How does the density vary? All these, today, we are talking of precisions which are of a fraction, or like a, 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 a thousandth of a percent, you know? We are talking of very high precision. So, so we are getting um, information about the interior of the sun, not through radiation, visible radiation, or, or radio radiation, or x-rays, or any x-ray in any case, you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you have to go above the Earth's mm -hmm. atmosphere. I mean, they, are, they get absorbed so easily. But even the long wavelengths, I mean, uh, uh, there's really no other way to, uh, presently, that we can probe the sun directly we need to, re we rely on indirect methods such as heliosesmology. And people are quite satisfied because it's given you, it's, there's, it's not like uh, uh, the, it's just rough estimates. They're, they're giving you very precise information which have been checked through other methods also. Okay, okay. Uh, next so question. Next question, what I'm saying is, uh, you said the dynamo models. Yes. So dynamo models are basically people are seeing the plasma is moving. There's a convection motion at the. It's the interaction of the magne ma magnetic field with the motions. Yes. Yeah. This is mostly because of the convection motion on the plasma by another surface. No. Yeah. That actually, there's a, uh, this dynamo takes place where you have convection, yeah. and the convection, as I mentioned, is from about, it's about 30% of the solar radius from the surface down. Mm -hmm. So in that region, you have, uh, you have uh, motions. So you need velocities, you need plasma to be moving, and you need to have magnetic fields. When you have magnetic fields and you have plasma, you can have a dynamo. Important thing is, can you sustain the dynamo? You know, you need, and there are all sorts of interesting technical questions about whether this dynamo, how you, what you would need to be able to sustain this dynamo. So uh, my question is, is this dynamo model is universal to all kind of stars? I mean, what about... Yes, I mean, that is one of the, yeah, you're, that's a good point. You see, uh, it's applicable to a class of stars. Yeah. Yeah. To, not to all stars, but to a class of stars. Uh, what are called slowly rotating type of stars, like G type of stars, what I mentioned to you. There are, there are stars which are rapidly rotating, which are like what are called A type of stars. Um, I, be, I think the general feeling is that it must be some dynamo. We still haven't come up with some other mechanism, but the dynamo is operating in a different, in a different regime, parameter regime, uh, and uh, so it can create, it can create uh, different types of fields. But uh, still, the idea is that it's a dynamo, whether it's uh, whether it's a, a, a slow rotating star or a rapidly rotating star. That's the general idea. And how about the uh, um, hotter stars, which have no convection uh, zone? They are only radiating zones in the star. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it is believed that those stars will be very difficult uh, to be able to generate a magnetic field in those type of stars through, these, through this type of mechanism, uh, like in white dwarfs or neutron stars, for example. Uh, th that's another topic we, we can talk about it later, but uh, that, uh, that's also, that's nobody really knows what the answer is. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. My question is, uh, like, uh, we see a feature called coronal, polar coronal lows. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes we see it at uh, uh, lower latitudes. What is the reason that we see those lows at uh, lower latitudes. Oh, sorry, what is supposed to lower? Polar coronal lows. Coronal, co coronal, what? I, I still haven't got the question. Polar coronal lows. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, it is uh, in the coronal region, there is, I think maybe due to load, I don't know the reason, due to load temperature or something, we uh, see oh, coronal darkening. Holes. Are you yeah. coronal holes? Are you talking about coronal Not holes? holes. Uh, in the picture you had, uh, one other picture showing those. No, dark uh, regions around the pole. The dark regions are called coronal holes. Uh, those okay. dark regions, okay. yeah, yeah, those big patches of very dark regions yeah, but, that uh, I showed you, those are called coronal holes. Okay. Those are regions, uh, again, of low density, very low field. Okay. Um, again, not very well understood okay. in, in the detailed physics. Uh, 
okay. of uh, how coronal holes are actually created. But one thing is for sure that you have actually big regions, almost like half a hemisphere or a quarter of a hemisphere, uh, usually at the time of low activity, uh, because that's the, these are regions of very low field. When you have uh, periods of uh, very little activity, you can have regions of the sun which are covered with this dark region that we uh, mentioned, which is called a coronal hole. Yeah, yeah, coronal yeah. Hole. yeah, coronal hole. So, so why are they uh, sometimes visible at the lower latitudes, huh? coming too near to the equator? I don't think there is any particular theory of, uh, you know, how coronal holes are actually generated. I mean, I'm not aware of any such thing. It's, I mean, these are all empirically, these are all empirically, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think we, I don't think there's any satisfactory explanation that I know of. I may be wrong. So, as you mentioned in a slide that the sunspots are created due to the convention currents don't reach those places. So, they are a little colder. So, why in the radio spectrum, like, we get, uh, get spikes? What spikes are you talking about? Like, when we detect sunspots in the radio spectrum, I read that they give spikes instead of dips. There is increased radio emissions there. I, I'm not aware of, of, this, of, of this particular aspect that you're talking about, about uh, the radio spectrum. I mean, when you say radio, the, there are different, uh, I mean, what wavelengths are you talking about? Are you talking about meter wavelengths or gigahertz or well, what kind of? Uh, gigahertz. Frequency? Gigahertz. Yeah. So the uh, people typically, uh, First of all, uh, the resolution of radio observations is very coarse. I don't think uh, you uh, typically uh, they would the resolution would be several thousand kilometers, not uh, you know what I mentioned earlier of, of, of hundreds of kilometers or, or 50, 60 kilometers. You know, uh, sunspot is a few thousand kilometers. I have a feeling that the radio wavelength resolutions would not be able to resolve the sunspot, but uh, I'm, I'm not even sure of which, what observation and what exactly is the point you're making about these glitches. What is it you, is there any specific point that you, you're making? I, uh, like actually we had uh, made a 1.8 uh, meter tele radio telescope uh, and we tried to detect the... Like, which radio telescope was this? It was a dish type radio telescope. Huh. So we uh, used it for uh, observing the eclipse. So that time while reading, you don't see you don't see sunspots at the time of an eclipse. You block the sun. You completely block the disk of the sun. What you see is the corona of the sun. You don't have. At, if you are looking at the sun at the time of an eclipse, even in radio or visible or anything, you are not going to see any sunspots because the sunspots you block them off completely. The Earth. The, what you are seeing is that the moon has completely, it's like a disk, which is completely blocked off the sun. So what you are seeing, that is the main yes. advantage of an eclipse, it allows you to study the corona of the sun. Yes, not like, I had read that uh, during the eclipse, like a part, before the total uh, eclipse occurs, there is part is covered. So uh, we can locate the uh, sunspots based on, like if a part is covered, the radiation is only coming from us part of the surface we are observing. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, okay, I, I think we need to talk about this. I'm not, I'm not very sure wh what, what, what ex you expect to learn from this in physics, from the physics point of view. Questions? Uh, how, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk, sir. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, how, uh, f uh, Good are we currently at uh, predicting, or I would say uh, a better question would be, uh, what would be the warning time uh, for a coronal, coronal mass e ejection that is coming towards the Earth? Yeah, it's a, that's a good point, actually. Uh, it takes uh, typically 24 hours. It's many hours it takes, but not many days. It takes many hours. Are we able to predict? Uh, are we able to predict? 
not, you can't predict a specific event. You can only know about it when it happens. What you can say is that when there, are, when there is high solar activity, the probability of having energetic events is very high. So you can be on the lookout that uh, you, know, you will be expecting. Sometimes people look at regions on the sun where people have been trying to say, is there any particular configuration of sunspots or any particular configuration of the magnetic field which is favorable to eruptions? So uh, you can get clues about it, but I don't think you can still, you can't say here you're going to get a coronal mass ejection, but you can say there's a good chance, there's a good probability. That's what you can say. So when you look at the, so two things, one is high solar activity and two is looking at particular magnetic configuration. So there are theoretical reasons for believing that uh, when the magnetic, magnetic topology has a certain, it, it is favorable for what is called reconnection, that is field lines of opposite polarities uh, basically canceling each other out and that would lead to a large amount of energy. So it depends, so those people you can, you can say that there is a good chance, but prediction uh, is difficult, but certainly when it happens, you know that you have so many hours because you know what the speed is and you know roughly, you can be able to track, you, you, you have models which can tell you how long it will take you for the sun to reach the earth. I don't mind, I mean, it's up to. Yeah. Um, so I understand that this is like a very open-ended question and people are still working and we don't know much about it, but... No, we know a lot about it, but we no, no, don't know uh, enough about it. No, but like if you had to give an explanation about the high temperatures of corona, so what... what about about what? The temperatures of corona. Yes. So like, what do you think, why is it so, like... Why is the corona hot? Uh, yeah, so significantly. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, again, there is no, uh, you know, again, definitive answer as to why is, uh, what is the basic process that creates a one and a half to two million degree corona. I mean, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention this, that this, uh, well, I mentioned that the surface temperature of the photosphere from where you get most of the light is about 6,000. And instinctively, you would imagine that if you move away from the source of energy, which is the nuclear reactions, the temperature would just keep, as you move away from the source of heat. But what happens is the temperature keeps on decreasing, but only up to a point for about five or 600 kilometers. And then the temperature starts rising, and then it rises, uh, in a distance of about 2,000 kilometers above the surface from 6,000 to about uh, 100,000. And then again, in a very short distance, it rises from 100,000 to about a million and to two million degrees. Uh, so this much is very well understood from spectroscopy. We can determine all these things quite well. The question is what, why, uh, what causes this temperature? So there was the first person who sort of had a shot at this was a German physicist in the 1940s. And he said this is due to the fact that when I mentioned that the convection zone produces a large amount of acoustic waves. And these acoustic waves are used for mapping the solar interior. But these acoustic waves also go the other way. They, they don't, not only go down, they also go up. And uh, as they go up, they steepen, they form shocks, and they start heating. So this was the first theory that this is due to the dissipation of a sound wave, acoustic waves. So people started looking for acoustic waves, observing, trying to observe. And this didn't work out. People, you didn't find enough uh, energy in acoustic waves. And the other problem is that when they dissipate, they dissipate very quickly. They don't even reach the corona. They dissipate much lower down. So then people felt this must have to do with some kind of a wave which is coupled to the magnetic field, some kind of a magnetoacoustic wave. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to get technical into it, but uh, there are some thoughts that these are related basically to some kind of, then there is another theory which came that there are actually m mini explosions taking place 
on the solar atmosphere, just all the time. And that, that's what keeps up the temperature. But it's like a intermittent process. It goes up, goes down, up. But the average, you get a... But none of these uh, uh, hypotheses have been conclusively established. And nobody knows how much one is contributing to the other. So they're, they're basically two schools of thought, to, as I said, to summarize. One school of thought is it's due to some kind of a wave which, which is generated lower down and dissipates higher up. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that you have complex magnetic topology, and that complex, uh, in that complex magnetic topology, there are on short, on small distances, rapid uh, reconnections taking place, which are producing heats, which are called like little, little nano flares, tiny little things, which are also producing a lot of. Uh, these are the thoughts, but still not, uh, not completely answered. So it's not like we don't know anything, but we, we know, we, we, we have some clues about what could be happening, but we don't still have, the, as we say, the smoking gun to be able to nail what that process is. I think, any more questions, do anybody has? Good, thank you.